and welcome to a show that's absolutely tail to bumper with motor vehicles of the four-wheeled variety. Yes, that's right, you've tuned in to Four Wheels Good. On today's show, the mistress of the motor, Ms Ginny Buckley, hops into a load lugger with style. John Wright shows us the tools of his trade in Inside Motors and we catch up with viewer Dr David Hay as he test drives the brilliantly economical Seat Ibiza TDI in Spain. But first, let's turn our attention to a car which is at the head of the luxury sports sector. We all recognise the Audi A8, but that's not quite what Ian Royal has been driving. If you take that particular car in its 4.2 quarter form and add sport suspension and an extra 40 brake horsepower, then add the letter S, you're close to the mark. Now, for the past few years, the luxury car sector has been dominated by the likes of Jaguar, BMW with their 7 Series, Mercedes with the S-Class and Toyota with the Lexus. But one car which should also be in that list is Audi's A8, a car that has that perceived rarity value because you see so few of them on the road and still has that ability to turn heads. Now the A8 has been around for nearly four years now and personally I think it's a gorgeous looking car. And there's one thing that Audi engineers and designers are very good at and that's coming up with hot versions of their cars. There was the S2, the S4 and the S6. Well now Audi engineers have gone back looking through their desk drawers at headquarters for that letter from the magical Audi alphabet, the letter S. And this is what they've come up with, the S8. Now up till now the A8 range has consisted of a 6 cylinder 2.8 litre engine and V8 3.7 and 4.2 litre engines. Well now the S8 ups the stake considerably, especially in the power department. The S8 gets a whopping 340 brake horsepower engine, as well as being linked to that Quattro four wheel drive system, Tiptronic gearbox and the sports suspension. Now everything is pretty much standard on the S8 as you would come to expect on this sort of car. You get climate control, there's a superb sound system and you get satellite navigation as well. Although you don't get the conventional system we've seen before with a TV screen. Instead you get a little display on the dashboard which tells you the route. One other great idea though is this. The solar sunroof. Now what the solar sunroof does is there are solar panels in the sunroof, top of the sunroof here and on a hot day when the sun is shining, energy is stored up in those panels which then when you're away from the vehicle, the energy from those panels allows the climate control system to carry on working whilst you're away from the vehicle. It's absolutely amazing. Now the main rival for the S8 is Jaguar's XJR V8, but the Audi wins hands down in terms of accommodation, both for passengers and in terms of boot space. Now where Jaguar always claim that you can fit two sets of golf clubs in the rear of their cars, with the Audi you can get the 18th green in as well. So what's the S8 like on the road and how does it drive? Well let's see shall we, and enjoy. The A8 really is a radical car in design and concept. The body is all aluminium, or should that be aluminium, like the guy in the TV ad calls it, and the Audi space frame is unique too. The car is packed with safety features, front airbags, four side airbags, ABS and ventilated disc brakes, plus EDL, which is a traction control system. And of course, not forgetting the Quattro drive system, which makes this car so sure-footed on the road. The use of aluminium in car production has a very positive effect on environmental pollution and that means that 90% of the aluminium in this car can be recycled and that also makes the car a lot lighter which helps tremendously with fuel consumption. This S8 will return around 27 to the gallon at a steady 75 miles per hour which is excellent for a 4.2 litre and a V8. So what's it really like to drive? Well, you put your foot down and the power just keeps coming and coming and coming. It's a very, very fast car indeed. In fact, you have to be so careful because you soon find yourself going far too fast. The suspension is very good. It's a sport suspension on the S8 and it's firm but very comfortable ride. And also the suspension has been lowered by 20 millimeters uh, as well as firm anti-roll bars to reduce the body movement. 
For such a big vehicle, it has all the feel of a thoroughbred sports car. Handling is excellent, the brakes will certainly stop you, although I did find that there was a bit of softness in the start of the brake pedal, but once your foot goes down, don't worry, you'll stop okay. It is a very fast car though, 0 to 60 in just over 6 seconds, top speed limited to 155 miles per hour, and for me, you couldn't find a nicer way of getting from A to B and doing it in style, comfort and with speed. So, what is the main competition for the Audi S8? Well, really, the only other large sporting saloon on the market is the Jaguar XJR V8, and that's had a tremendous amount of acclaim, and rightly so, but for me, I really, really like this car. I've grown to love it over the past few days. And I think also the fact that you don't see many A8s out on the road, that adds to its exclusivity. I mean, let's face it, in some areas of the country, BMWs, Jaguars and Mercedes are almost 10 a penny. So what will an S8 cost you? Well, £7,000 more than the 4.2 Quattro Sport and over £10,000 more than the Jaguar XJR. So if you want one, get out your checkbook and write £62,000 in that little box and an S8 will be yours and believe me you won't be disappointed. A bit of a dream car at that price maybe I'll check the finances later. Well it's over to Spain now where we ran into Dr David Hay one of our many regular viewers who was holidaying out there. When he found out what we were testing in España we couldn't resist letting him drive the set Ibiza TDI. Everybody knows about the great Golf TDI. It's a superb car with plenty of punch. Well, there's a new competitor on the market that you may not know about. It's this. It's the Seat Ibiza. It's fairly plain in design. A standard European small car. But you can't get away from the impressive image we now have of the TDI sister, the Cupra Sport which has been making its mark in the world of rallying recently. Inside, well, it's fairly nondescript. As you'd expect, the dials are easily visible, the knobs and buttons are all fairly accessible, and with the inclusion of a neat stereo, you feel your life has been made that little bit easier. And of course, we mustn't forget the power steering and the air conditioning. Less and less of a luxury these days, more of a necessity. The driver's seat is fully adjustable, There's plenty of headroom. However, I did find that after a three hour continuous drive, the lumbar region of my back began to ache slightly. Well, that's a bit harsh, maybe. You do find this with many cars in this class. It wasn't exactly the TARDIS, but it did surprise me how much I managed to fit in the boot. One area that I really enjoyed was the brute power that lies beneath the deceptively understated lines of this vehicle. It's not quite a wolf in sheep's clothing, but it does have the bite. Overtaking is no problem. When the turbo kicks in, you sail effortlessly past the longest of lorries in seconds. When it comes to cornering, I want the best. I took the Ibiza around some pretty contorted hill roads in northwest Spain and it didn't let me down. The brakes were precise and efficient. They did their job. In summary, I liked this car. It did what I wanted when I wanted it. However, with an engine like that, I would hope that it would look a bit more like it drives.
Well, I said at the beginning I thought this was a great competitor for the VW. And now that I've put it through its paces, I'm absolutely certain. Of course, it's got a problem, and that's VW's reputation. But I'm telling you, this car is going to have a hell of a reputation in the future, too. A viewer whose motoring passion knows no bounds, David Hay. And the combined fuel economy of those things is absolutely fantastic. After the break, Ginny Buckley will be testing another car with a Volkswagen engine, the VW Passat Estate. See you then. Welcome back to Four Wheels Good, the genuine grand tourer of the motoring world. A car which has relatively recently had a celebrated radical facelift is Volkswagen's Passat. But it's not just the saloon version that's wowing the public. Ginny Buckley has been driving the VW Passat estate and puzzling over its popularity. Are you one of those people who, when you're doing a crossword, insists on writing it all out very neatly, even though nobody else is going to see it? Hmm. Have you ever been offered a job at Volkswagen? I'm talking about attention to detail, obsession. The theme of the advertising campaign for the new Volkswagen Passat. The obsession theme would seem to have more than an element of truth when you reflect that the Volkswagen team behind the new Passat must have spent months perfecting the ergonomically designed damp and grab handles or the lovely thick rim steering wheel or that solid thunk of the door closing. And don't we all just appreciate that right kind of soft rubber to line the coin tray? All minor details perhaps, but the plus points add up to create the award-winning success story the new Passat Saloon is. But this is not the Passat Saloon. Just arrived in the showrooms, this is the new Passat Estate. This load-lugging version of the saloon should in theory be a great hit in the UK if only because estates of previous Passats have always been big sellers. Unlike some estate versions I could mention, the variant back-end style looks naturally in proportion to the front. Its clean, cool lines may not shout fashion statements, but instead they ooze a kind of sophisticated modernism. It simply looks good. But estate buyers will be far more interested on what's on offer inside, and they won't be disappointed. On paper, the Renault Laguna estate may have a far roomier load bay, but the Passat estate is actually wider and generally far more useful. And there's no fashionable fancy curved end here. Volkswagen have remembered that most of the time you fill your boot with suitcases and big square boxes, and as a result, everything is extremely angular so you can fit the maximum amount in. Just look at the thought processes Volkswagen must have gone through to anticipate the needs of the estate user. There's a low-level floor, a wide opening, a protective covering for the bumper, a bright metal load bay lip shield, there's chrome load lashing points, slide rails to protect the carpet, 12 volt power sockets for portable fridges or whatever, and when you're ready to close the tailgate, you have twin handles to prevent your little fingers getting dirty. Do you remember the days when the extra stiffening and suspension adjustments that were needed for estate cars meant they weren't as much fun to drive as their saloon sisters? These days manufacturers have found ways to keep the driving dynamics very similar from saloon to estate and the Passat is no exception. The new four-link front suspension and separately mounted springs and dampers give a very smooth ride. While the driving experience is not exactly thrilling, but it's certainly very willing. I'm driving the 1.9 TDI Sport, yes, a diesel, but this is a direct injection turbo diesel. It gives off 110 brake horsepower at 1900 RPMs. With performance like this, the days of the hopelessly sluggish oil burner are long since gone. For real power freaks though, just wait a few months when the Passat Estate will be available with the revolutionary VR5 2.3 litre petrol engine or the 30 valve 2.8 litre V6 boasting 193 brake horsepower. Both of these will be available with a Tiptronic gearbox. File under wild and wicked sporting estates. When putting the Passat's interior together, somebody obviously had a very good rummage through the Audi parts bin which, I must say, is no bad thing. 
The interior has a very solid and expensive look and feel to it. There are cup holders galore, cubby holes everywhere, and what about these wonderful louvered vents? It's comfortable to drive as well. The steering wheel adjusts in two directions and there's an excellent ratchet style height seat adjustment system. Overall, the Passat Estate is just as impressive as the saloon. It's extremely stylish and very practical. But there are a few flies in the ointment. It's a real shame that in the advertising campaign, Volkswagen made us look at obsession to detail. Because on the estate, there's just a few little things that make it lose marks. First of all, the radio. It's too low down, and you end up taking your eyes off the road too much to fiddle around with it. The fuel filler doesn't fit properly, and is it really meant to be this flimsy? The clutch footrest is at the wrong angle. The angle is a bit too steep for comfort. But all of those are just little niggles when you look at the Passat Estate overall. The car is really a magnificent achievement that should worry the likes of Audi, BMW, and maybe even Mercedes. For a starting price of just under £16,000, you get a solid, reliable and well-built estate with plenty of room that should experience excellent residual values. Let me leave you with this thought. This particular Passat estate has the new TDI 110 brake horsepower engine, independently assessed as the most fuel-efficient internal combustion engine ever installed in a production passenger car and they've installed this engine in the most aerodynamic car in its class. The result? An astonishing 63 miles per gallon on the urban cycle. Less trips to the filling station and less chances for you to have to open your wallet. 12 across. A description of the new Volkswagen Passat estate and a term of farewell. Goodbye. It's amazing how Volkswagen have paid so much attention to the details of the car, but I suppose Jenny's right, it all adds up. Well, it's time now to fly over to the magical mechanical world of the man with the moustache. That's right, John Wright's Inside Motors. Right, he's just setting the uh, head grinding machine up so we can uh, grind the head flat. And what this does is it gives the gasket a very good key. So we get a good gasket fit. It also, if you've got a problem with the uh, head gaskets blowing, it'll cure that. And as a consequence, it just raises the compression ratio a little bit as well. Absolutely beautiful, thank you very much. Okay. Right, it's just loading the block up on the boring machine, get it all flat, nice square. Check it for rocking. Clean the top off a little bit. And you can put some clamps and grips in it. And put a straight edge across it.
Looks like we might have to surface grind it. How far do you think it is out? Well, it's certainly more than the paper, which we know the paper's too thou thick. Because you can move the paper under the straight edge. It's hard to say exactly, but we'll better determine that when it's on the surface grinding machine. OK, I'm, we're in your hands. I mean, if you say it's out, it's obviously out. Yeah, it uh, we'll surface grind. Do you do that before boring or after? Do it after boring, but before honing. OK, lovely. OK, Robert, these are the pistons we're going to use. Right. Okay, I'll set me bore gauge to suit that size then. What size, what size is it? It's 2.542 inches, which is standard size for a mini thousand. Lovely. OK, you get away with it. taking a lot out, yeah. it is going to take a lot out. I'll have to do it in two two passes, two two cuts because when you when you go to, to your finished size you don't want to be taking more than about 20 thou out and there's 44 thou to come out so I'll, I'll take it in two cuts. Okay, um, okay fair dues. What, what Robert's just explained is because uh, we're taking a 948 block uh, to uh, suit mini pistons, which is a 998TC. He's going to have to do it in two cuts. Well, that's fine by me, as long as he can take it out. John will be mixing up magic amongst the oil and nuts of Inside Motors next week. Also on next week's show, Ian Royal will be enjoying the life of an off-roader at a muddy event in Yorkshire, which happens every year in Kenya and is designed to raise money for the conservation of rhinos. And Jenny Buckley will be examining the Mark IV Golf and comparing it to its predecessors. See you then.